What's up, family? Welcome back to Unauthorized History. If you're new to my channel, I'm the official conscious dude, and I'm here to talk to you about black history and black news. Now, the topic of bus segregation amongst the black and white Americans in the southern United States still invokes strong emotions to this day. Did you know that almost 64 years ago, on November 13, 1956, the Supreme Court affirmed a ruling that found that segregated bus laws in Montgomery, Alabama were unconstitutional? During the years leading up to this landmark ruling, there were a host of various protests. One of these protests began on April 9, 1947. On that day, 16 brave young men started a two-week journey that acted as the inspiring umbrella to the freedom rise that occurred later in the civil rights movements in the 1960s. This journey was known as the Journey of Reconciliation. Let's get into it. But if you think the battle's won, think again. The fact is, for each one we reach, there's one we can't. And if we can't reach them, chances are nobody can. Because a mind is a terrible thing to waste. In 1942, George Hauser, James Farmer, and Bayard Rustin, members of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, or FOR, or for short, established the Congress of Racial Equality, C-O-R-E, CORE for short. Heavily influenced by the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, the members of the CORE felt that they could promote a culture of inclusion and equality for African Americans through nonviolent protests in America. CORE became the umbrella for the eight black men and the eight white men who contributed to this journey. The organizers included George Hauser, white Methodist minister of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and CORE, and the black Quaker Bayard Rustin of four and the American Friends Service Committee. The other black participants were Dennis Banks, the Chicago musician, Andrew Johnson, a student from Cincinnati, New York attorney, Conrad Lynn, Wallace Nelson, a freelance lecturer, Eugene Stanley of North Carolina A&T College, William Worthy of the New York Council for a Permanent FEPC, and Nathan Wright, a church social worker from Cincinnati. The other white participants were North Carolina ministers Lewis Adams and Ernest Bromley, Joseph Felmet of the Southern Workers Defense League, Homer Jack, the Executive Secretary of the Chicago Council Against Racial and Religious Discrimination, and James Peck, editor of the Workers Defense League News Bulletin, Worth Randall, a Cincinnati biologist, and radical pacifist Egal Rodenko. These 16 men began gearing up for the journey of reconciliation. Walter White of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP for short, strongly disapproved of this type of direct action. But he willingly volunteered the service of the NAACP's attorneys throughout their campaign. Thurgood Marshall, head of the NAACP's legal department, did not agree with what the members of the Journey of Reconciliation were doing and he warned that a disobedience movement on the part of the Negroes and their white allies, if employed in the South, would result in wholesale slaughter with no good achieved. Bayard Rustin wrote an article for the Louisiana Weekly to reply to what Thurgood Marshall had said about the Congress on Racial Equalities or CORE's decision to organize the journey of reconciliation on April 1st, 1947. In this article, he stated, I am sure that Marshall is either ill-informed on the principles and techniques of nonviolence or ignorant of the process of social change. Unjust social laws and patterns do not change because the Supreme Courts deliver just decisions. One needs merely to observe the continued practice of Jim Crow and interstate travel, six months after the Supreme Court's decision, to see the necessity of resistance. Social progress comes from struggle. All freedom demands a price. At times, freedom will demand that its followers go into situations where even death is to be faced. Resistance on the buses would, for example, mean humiliation, mistreatment by police, arrest, and some physical violence inflicted on the participants. But, if anyone at this date in history believes that the white problem, which is one of privilege, can be settled without some violence, he is mistaken and fails to realize the ends to which men can be driven to hold on to what they consider their privileges. This is why Negroes and whites who participate in direct action must pledge themselves to nonviolence in word and deed. 
For, in this way alone, can the inevitable violence be reduced to a minimum. Nevertheless, on April 9, 1947, the journey of reconciliation began under these strict instructions. If you're a Negro, sit in the front seat. If you're a white, sit in the rear seat. If the driver asks you to move, tell him calmly and courteously, as an interstate passenger, I have a right to sit anywhere in this bus. This is the law as laid down by the United States Supreme Court. If the driver summons the police and repeats his order in their presence, tell him exactly what you said when he first asked you to move. If the police ask you to come alone without putting you under arrest, tell them you will not go until you are put under arrest. If the police put you under arrest, go with them peacefully. At the police station, phone the nearest headquarters of the NAACP or one of your lawyers, they will assist you. The journey of reconciliation has some support from the ruling of the 1946 U.S. Supreme Court case. On June 3, 1946, the Supreme Court of the United States announced its decision in the case of Irene Morgan versus the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, if you've been following my channel, then you know that I made a video on Irene Morgan and her case. I will place the link in the description box below for your review. Now, the outcome of the Irene Morgan versus the Commonwealth of Virginia case meant that state laws demanding segregation of interstate passengers on commercial carriers are now unconstitutional, for segregation of passengers crossing state lines was declared an undue burden on interstate commerce. Thus, it was decided that Jim Crow laws do not affect interstate travelers. In a later decision in the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, the Morgan decision was interpreted to apply to interstate train travel as well as bus travel. Under this ruling, during a two-week period from April 9th to April 23rd, 1947, the interracial group of men traveling as a deputation team visited 15 cities in Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Kentucky. They conducted more than 30 speaking engagements before churches, NAACP, and college groups. During the ride, blacks were to sit in the front and whites were to sit in the back. Sometimes they rode side by side and that also violated the current bus segregation laws. The Southern United States were reluctant to embrace the decision of the courts. According to Wikipedia, the riders had been arrested several times for instance. When they reached North Carolina, the participants planned to ride public transportation starting in Washington, D.C. Then they would go through Richmond and stop in Petersburg. The next day, they went through Raleigh, and once they hit Durham, North Carolina, the bus driver called the police on Ruston, who refused to move to the back of the bus. The police did nothing, and all that happened was the bus was delayed for 45 minutes while the bus driver and Bayard Ruston refused to both move. During a two-week trip, African Americans continued to sit in front, white Americans sat in back, or sometimes side by side, all in violation of current state laws which require pass passengers to practice segregated seating in buses. The day after the bus driver called the police on Bayard Rustin, the group of eight white men and eight black men met with Intercollegiate Council for Religion and Life and attended church services. On April 13th, four of the men were arrested, two black men for not giving up their seat and two white men for defending the two black men. James Peck went to pay their bonds and was hit by a taxi driver in the head. Racial tension began to grow as the journey went on. Martin Watkins, a veteran, was beaten by a group of taxi drivers for speaking to an African-American woman at a bus stop. In May 1947, the two black men and the two white men who had been arrested earlier in the bus ride faced charges afterwards and did not win when they appealed their sentences. On March 21, 1949, Rustin and the two white men lost in the courthouse in Hillsboro and were sent to segregated chain gangs. The judge, Henry Whitfield, openly expressed his aversion towards the white men involved in this journey of reconciliation. He was quoted as saying, It's about time you Jews from New York learned that you can't come down here bringing your blanks with you to upset the customs of the South. Just to teach you a lesson, I gave your black boys 30 days on a chain gang and I give you 90. The NAACP did offer a limited amount of legal protection to the arrested individuals. 
Bayard Rustin believe that the journey of reconciliation, as well as other actions challenging segregation in these years, contributed to the eventual ruling in the Supreme Court case in 1954 of Brown versus Board of Education. The journey of reconciliation ended on April 23, 1947. The 16 men who participated in the journey of reconciliation were brave men who accomplishments deserved to be celebrated. All right, family, I just want to say thank you guys for bearing with me throughout the video. I lost my voice recently, and I was trying to wait until it came back for me to produce this video, but I didn't want to wait any longer, and I wanted to get this video out to you guys as soon as possible. So thank you guys for bearing with me. Now, it is vital to note that racism is a vice that any person can fall victim to at one time. Can you imagine the opposition and the danger that those 16 men faced during their two-week journey? They all sacrificed a lot, and as you heard in the video, several of them were sentenced to chain gangs just for their participation, both black and white. The 1946 Supreme Court ruling in the case of Irene Morgan versus the Commonwealth of Virginia was initially not honored by many of the southern states. Civil rights activists such as Thurgood Marshall were hesitant in lending support to the journey of reconciliation because of the potential for this movement to cause violence and heighten racial tensions among the black and white Americans who lived in the South. Now, before I go, I would like to give a shout out to my homegirl Aoife K. She's been a big supporter of mine, so please check out her channel when you have time. She gives amazing reviews and do-it-yourself tips. Please leave a comment down below and tell me how you felt about this topic we discussed. Thank you all for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe for more content. All right, peace family.